In 1867, Alfred Nobel patented the nitroglycerin-based explosive we all know as dynamite. This extremely powerful explosive was in great demand in Cornwall because of the huge number of mines in the county at the time. Dynamite proved to be far superior than the old way of blasting, which was using gunpowder. As time went on, gunpowder became less and less popular and the numerous manufacturers in the area foresaw the decline of their industry. In the tiny village of Ponsonuth, the Kennel Vale Gunpowder Company was one of the largest producers of gunpowder in the country, but with the increasing use of dynamite, the directors started investigating how to manufacture nitroglycerin, with plans to open a dynamite factory once Nobel's patent expired. In 1888, the National Explosives Company was incorporated and the sand dunes at Upton Towers, which is 11 miles away from Kennel Vale and just outside the town of Hale, were deemed the perfect place to build the factory. The factory quickly took shape, with wooden and brick buildings springing up all over the place. The factory took advantage of the large hills and valleys on the dunes when constructing process buildings, using gravity to move raw materials around the site. Large mounds, called traverses, were placed around the danger building so that in the event of an explosion, the shockwave would be directed upwards and not communicate to an adjacent building, and therefore triggering off a chain reaction. This system of mounding is still in use today, in explosives factories around the world and can still be seen on Upton Towers. The factory was separated into two sections, the danger area, which was deep into the dunes close to the sea, and the services area, which was closest to the main road. The services area comprised of the acid factories for producing sulfuric and nitric acids, steam boilers and engines for compressors and electrical generators. Large overhead pipes carried steam, cold water and electricity around the site. Water was supplied from the boiling well mine which occupied the towns before it became an explosives factory. It closed down in 1862 and flooded, and the old shafts were used as a convenient supply. Despite its name as boiling well, the water is extremely cold, something that is vital for nitroglycerin production. The production of nitroglycerin happens in many stages. The most dangerous part is in the precipitation hut. This is where the glycerin is nitrated with acid, It then leaves the precipitation hut via a launder, running downhill and into a building where it is washed. The acids are then separated and reused. The nitroglycerin is then mixed with a form of clay to further stabilise it and then the mixture is taken to a cartridge hut where teams of three or four girls would extrude the mixture into waxed paper and roll them into cartridges. The cartridges were then taken onto a packing building where they were placed into boxes ready for shipping. The products produced here were a huge success and the company grew rapidly and by 1890 the site was employing 175 people and producing 3 tonnes of dynamite per day. Over the next 10 years the company started to develop other types of explosive including blasting gelatin and cordite. Cordite is a mixture of gun cotton, nitroglycerin, acetone and petroleum jelly. It's used by the Navy for the huge guns on battleships. And in the build-up to the First World War, the National was chosen as a secondary supplier to the War Office, as the Navy's own production facilities were unable to produce the quantities needed.
Unfortunately, as with all explosives factories of the age, there were a number of fatal accidents, but when you factor in the scale of the facilities, the huge quantities of explosives made at the site, and the general consensus is that the National did have one of the best safety records in the world. The first accident happened on the 4th of September 1894, when lead bowls were being used for gelatinisation. Two men emptied the contents into a mixer, but it's thought a foreign body was in the mix, which caused it to detonate as it was poured. The building was totally destroyed and the two men lost their lives. Almost five years later, on the 19th of October 1899, gelatin was being manufactured by mixing nitroglycerin with nitrocotton in bowls heated by hot water. The gelatin that formed was cut with a wooden blade, which on this occasion started a fire which led to an explosion. Most of the workers were able to run safely, but a young boy working on the site did not understand the danger and was unfortunately killed in the resulting blast. Two years later in 1901, a series of six accidents involving the manufacture of gun cotton occurred throughout the year. Luckily, none of these six accidents resulted in any deaths or injuries, only damage to buildings or equipment. But it was in 1904 that the worst accident occurred, when on the 5th of January somebody dropped a lead-lined lid of a nitrating vat onto the floor of the precipitation house, which resulted in a massive explosion. At the time of the explosion the nitroglycerin was being transferred to the wash house and the explosion travelled via the launder and both buildings exploded instantaneously. Five people were killed instantly and the shockwave travelled across the bay for four miles, shattering windows and blowing people off their feet in St Ives. The accident made headlines around the world and the Daily Express writer wrote, The whole 30 mile area of West Cornwall was thrown into a state of alarm and almost panic on Tuesday morning by the roar and concussion of a terrific explosion at the works of the National Explosive Company at Gwythian, near Hale, eight miles from Penzance. It was at first rumoured that the works had been completely destroyed, but even when this exaggeration had been dispelled, it was made only too clear that a serious disaster had occurred. The explosion resulted in the loss of lives of five of the workmen and injuries to others. Just before 11 o'clock, Dense clouds of smoke ascended from the works, nearly enveloping hail in darkness, while the concussion following upon the two explosions was so great that in places 10 or 15 miles away, people fled from their houses and into the streets in alarm, and the glass of windows was smashed. Indeed, the explosion was heard throughout a considerable part of the duchy. There was instantly a rush of hundreds of hatless and half-clothed people men, women and children from Hale and the neighbourhood towards the works. The affrighted people were met by many of the workers with their faces cut and torn, fleeing in panic from the dangerous zone, and this only served to increase the general anxiety. It was soon discovered by the officials that two houses or sections in which cordite was made had completely vanished, together with all their contents, human and structural. In their place was a great hole in the sand, and scattered around were fragments of human remains, lead and splintered timber. Each of the houses had two men working in it, and all four men were instantly killed. They were blown to atoms. A fifth victim, a Swede named Oscar Holman, who died during the afternoon from a broken back, the shock of the explosion hurling him down. The following is a list of the killed. Andrew Kerno, 25, married, left widow and two children. William Luxmore, 25, married, left widow and one child. Simon Jory, 22, single. William Cliff, 20, single, and Oscar Hellman. The injuries to a number of other men were of a superficial character. Several remarkable escapes occurred. One man was blown through the door of a house at the works, and three young chemists who were close by were knocked over, but only one man was cut, and not that seriously. Business at Hale was almost suspended for the day, and an air of gloom pervaded the place, while among the operatives there was a feeling of nervousness and awe. A serious panic among the employees was averted by the assistant manager, Mr Bate, who found the men and girls pouring out of their homes. 
Seeing that all the danger was over, he ordered them back to their work and all returned for a short period. An extraordinary feature of the disaster was the damage done in the fishing town of St Ives, which is separated from the works by three or four miles of sea. The great cloud of smoke was plainly seen and the shockwave was even more severe than in the town of Hale itself. Shop fronts and house windows fell into the streets and roads were covered in shattered glass, some of it plate glass three eighths of an inch thick. One woman who was carrying a baby was thrown off her feet but not injured. In another place, a portion of house fell away and an old woman, either from the fright or shock, became unconscious and remained so for some time. The fine old stained glass window at the eastern end of the parish church was quite ruined. At Penzance, 10 miles from the explosives works, the concussion was distinct and was thought to be a gas explosion in the town. Windows were also broken there. At 5 o'clock in the afternoon, another explosion occurred, but this was attended by little damage to property and no loss of life. The officials at the works expressed the opinion that the cause of the explosion will never be known. The works employ about 100 hands. It was to be 12 years until the next accident, when during the First World War, on the 20th of December 1916, another huge explosion would kill four people. It's generally thought that not much information exists about this accident because it was during the war enshrouded in secrecy. So we went to the National Archives in London and searched the Home Office files for the National Explosives Company. What we found was a fascinating report into the accident, which in a nutshell says that the exact cause of the explosion will never be known, but the most likely cause was a static electricity spark or an atmospheric charge in the air. Contained within the report was a series of diagrams detailing the damage to the buildings and where they actually were on the site. Perhaps the most macabre diagram is this one, which details where the body parts were found. It's hard to get a scowl from this diagram, so we mark the locations using grass paint and using a drone you can see just how large and powerful the accident was. This was where building D4 was. It contained four stoves fed with steam and was used for drying the nitro cotton. It was this exact building photographed here in 1909 that exploded in 1916. Two girls were in the building at the time of the explosion. Both died instantly. May Bella Stoneman was just 21 years old and Harriet Isabella Rogers was just 20. They were both buried side by side at Philak Church just a few miles away. The inscription on May's headstone reads that she died whilst doing her duty for her country. Two men also died that day. James Perry was 50 and he was the foreman for that section of the factory and James Cock was a 60-year-old labourer employed to cut the grass on the site. He was working on the hill overlooking D4 and his body was found exactly here at X1. Unfortunately, this was not the last accident on the site and on January 11th, 1918, a cordite press exploded, killing one, taking the final death toll to 12. The site eventually closed when the company failed in 1919, 
after 31 short years. The end of the war and the decline in mining in the area meant that such a huge site was no longer viable. In the next few years the dunes were stripped bare and the site was used for explosive storage until the 1960s. Now the place is going back to nature, but the relics from the past can still be seen just about everywhere. Why don't you come and pay it a visit next time you're around?